Hello and a very, very warm welcome to Nobano Earth Weekend or New Festival 2021, presented by the Suresh Omeo Memorial Trust. This festival began in 2019 in Shantiniketan. This year, we are doing it as a virtual online festival because the pandemic situation does not allow us all to gather in Shantiniketan, no matter how much we would love to and like to be there. Um, this session this afternoon that we're going to present before you is in memory of the esteemed artist Shomna Kaur, for whom 2021 is a centennial year. And uh, Shomnatha has always had a very special connection with Shantini Ketan. We know him, of course, as a very, very well-known sculptor. But apart from that, printmaking, as well as his sketches and his drawings, have given him a very preeminent place in our cultural history. And I'm really looking forward to today's session. As we start, I would like to introduce you to our panelists today who are going to participate in this discussion of ideology and the artist. R. Shivkumar is professor of art history at Vishwabharati in Shantiniketan. Born in Kerala, educated in Kerala and Shantiniketan, he is a noted art historian, curator, and the author of over 15 books. With his research on the artists of Bengal, the Shantiniketan masters, and major Indian artists associated with Shantini Ketan. He has both extensively remapped an important trajectory in modern Indian art and impacted its discourse. Thank you so much for joining us today, Shivda. I would next like to welcome Shonchayan Ghosh, artist, pedagogue. He currently works as an associate professor in the Department of Painting at Vishwabharati University, Shantini Ketan and he has explored workshop-based collective community dialogues, worked closely with different theater forms from all over India. He participated in the first Kochi Musivist Biennale in 2012 and Documenta 14 in 2017. He has been associated with different pedagogy projects with NST, FICA, and 5 million incidents, which was presented by Max Miller Bhavan Goethe Institute, Kolkata. Further, he co-curated the second session of Under the Mango Tree in Shantiketan 2020. He's one of the curators of the 2018 Kochi Museris Students Biennale Kochi. And Shonchanda is also uh, a very well-established scenographer. He has worked extensively in theater and uh, is an installation artist as well. Shumon Mukhopadhyay, thank you for joining us today. Shumon is a theater and film personality. His, both his theater and his cinema deal with socio-political domain, with the socio-political domain and engage in critical assessment of the contemporary, including explorations into subaltern realities and histories. He has directed seven full-length feature films, including Nazarban 2020 and Herbert 2005, which won the national award. Schumann's major plays are Tista Pare Brittanto, Mephisto, King Lear, and Bishorjo. He has participated and won awards in various national and international theater and film festivals, including Busan, if I'm pronouncing it correct, Montreal, Dubai, Munich, San Francisco, Seattle, and Kerala. He's really been sort of spanning the globe there. Recently, his film Nazar Band, or Captive, had its uh, world premiere at the Busan International Film Festival. And Posham pa, part of Z5 original films, won an award in, in 2020 as well. Sh uh, Shuman has taught and directed plays at University of California, Berkeley, at Toledo University, Kalamazoo, and Bernard College in the US. Holding this wonderful panel together during the discussion is our moderator, Shumona Chakraborty, artist in her own right. She is the founder of Hamdasti, a Kolkata-based arts platform for socially engaged arts practice. Her work is participatory in nature, engaging diverse communities over long periods of time and collaboratively intervening in public spaces. 
Shumona is a graduate of the Srishti School of Art, Design and Technology, Bangalore. She has a master's degree from the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University. She has been a fellow at the Art Think South Asia program at Forge, Delhi, and at the Global Cultural Leaders program hosted by the European Union. Right now, Shumona is also the deputy director of Hore Baire, the museum at Currency Building, the DAG Museum, and uh, which has a wonderful collection of modern Bengal art. Shumona, after thanking everybody again for being here and for sparing your time, may I hand over to you to please take this discussion forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anjum, and a warm welcome to everybody, to our panelists, to all the audience members, and thank you to the Navanno team for organizing this discussion. Uh, it's a special privilege to be here discussing the life and work of Shomna Thor and how his work connects to our times, um, especially I think it's all of us have engaged with that in some way, uh, with, with the intersection of arts and politics in some way in our work. Um, so I won't really, you know, talk much. I just go straight to our panelists to begin today's discussion, um, starting with Shivada. Shivada, many of us are familiar with um, Shomnath Thor's work, of course, but for the uninitiated, could you tell us a little bit about his early forays into art and politics and how he ended up uh, sort of finding the convergence between the two spheres? Hey, thank you, Shomana, and thank you for calling me to this evening's discussion. Uh, well, Somnada, as we always called him, I mean, was born um, as 100 years ago in Chittagong. I mean, so we are having a centenary this year. And before I go into his ideological background, he has written that the first traumatic experience he had was the death of his father when he was 14. And that left a sense of insecurity in him, which he says continued till he was about 60. So that was a very deeply uh, moving experience. And of course, this even pushed his family into difficult times. And his mother took up charge of the family and held it together very stoically. This is again, I think something important to his personality in a sense. Under these circumstances, he comes to Calcutta in 1940 for further studies. And there he is introduced to art and activism in a small way. But he couldn't finish his studies. He has to rush back to Chittagong because of the Second World War situation and the fear of war. And in 42, he goes back and there he encounters first the disasters of war and then of famine. And it is here that he begins to draw more seriously. Guided by Chitta Prasad, he begins to document the famine and his documentations of the famine gets printed in the journals of the Communist Party. And that's noted by various people higher up in the rank. And with the encouragement of P.C. Joshi, he is enrolled in the Calcutta Art College in 1945. And there he gets to see Sainud Abedin, who was a very young teacher at that time, and he's bowled over by his famine sketches, which also reveal to Somnadha his own technical inadequacy. So he has Sainud Abedin as a model for some time. While he was a student in 1946, he goes to document the Tevaga movement. And the next year in 47, the tea garden agitations. So both these are in the nature of documentation, but you can see there a movement from suffering to agitation to an assertion of the need for social justice by these suffering people. So it's, it's one of the most optimistic aspects of his work. And then of course, 
as you can see, what happens in this period is that his existential sense of personal suffering gets transformed into a sense of collective suffering. And the causes of which are social and political. So I think this was a very important uh, shift and this is the basis of his ideological commitments. Of course, in 48, we know the Communist Party is banned and he goes underground at the end of that year with many others. He remains underground for more than a year, then he comes back, then he begins to work in Calcutta in close ties with the party. But in 56, he decides to break his official ties with the party. He doesn't renew his membership. And uh, 58, he leaves for New Delhi, where he takes up a job, he becomes a teacher, and that marks a different beginning. So his ideological moorings are in this phase before, I mean, 46, 47, that's the period where actually he comes uh, to develop those attitudes which remain with him. When we connect these early years of personal tragedy, um, of you know this mentorship under Zainul Abidin, his extensive travels, and then his search also, you know, like you said, for uh, uh, his, his personal journey also to overcome his inadequacies as an artist or in search of a kind of formal excellence or a new kind of formal experimentation leads him eventually to some of the works that he is now better known for that perhaps all of us have seen and, and internalized in our own ways, all the members of the panel. So how would you connect some of, uh, could you talk to us about some of these uh, later works, which, you know, have perhaps had okay. a personal resonance with you um, and how it connects back to these early years of politics and personal okay. loss and agitation. And this is a question also for Shivada, but other, other members of the panel as well. Okay, let me tell you a little more about what happened when he shifted to Delhi before I talk about mm. maybe one or two of his works. Mm. Uh, well, in Calcutta, he was surrounded by uh, colleagues in the party, comrades in the party. But in Delhi, he was now surrounded by modern artists. So that was one big shift. And the 50s, especially the late 50s, was a great time of experimentation in printmaking all over the world. And Sonada was drawn into that spirit of experimentation while he was there. And he, through his own personal efforts and experiments, he masters a number of old and new technical processes in printmaking. Now, that was very important for him. Now, it, he really gets recognized as an artist at this point of time. In fact, in the early 60s, he wins three national awards, which is quite a rare thing. And, um, but very soon, he is disillusioned. I think the formalist approach of the artist, as well as the indifference towards social issues, probably, I mean, made him leave Delhi very suddenly in 67. And a year or so later, he shifts to Shantanikism, where he lives in relative isolation from the art world for the rest of his life. But what he achieved, the kind of technical mastery, as well as the artistic freedom that he achieved in the 60s, was very important for his later development. Because the most important thing that he now realized is necessary and which he could do was how to connect the materiality of the different mediums with his thematic concerns. So although his thematic concerns remained constant, the people who were oppressed and the kind of wounds society inflicted on them, their embodiment differed from one medium to the other. So you can look at his 
etchings, it would happen in one way. In his woodcuts, it would be something else. In the lithographs, it would take another form. In the pulp prints, which he developed, it would take still another form in his engravings and later in his sculptures. So, which was important because that allowed him to kind of keep that fire alive in him without, I mean, kind of lapsing into tedious repetition, which is a problem if you think that if you're stuck with a theme, with an idea, you can be obsessed, but in the repetitive process as an artist, you can go blunt. And Somnatha overcame this danger by shifting from one medium to another and using the possibilities of the medium to reinvent that theme as it were. So what we see in his later works is not a thematic shift as such, but a kind of sensuous particularity which he brings to each object that he makes. Now, these works cannot be associated with particular political or activist campaigns. It's a general concern for the people and their suffering. But from time to time, he did kind of respond to specific events uh, pretty emotionally and identified with it. One was the the Bangladesh war. The other work was a large sculpture. Unfortunately, it was stolen soon after it was made. But this was a remarkable piece. It showed a female figure with the breast blasted out. But she stood straight, held her head up, and she cradled child in her arms. And this was his way of commemorating the Vietnamese victory. So this is something I think remarkable that he would go back and to some extent, I somehow personally think that this image is description of his mother as this toy person in the time of crisis stands up and protects her family is somewhere behind this work. Because this description of her, and when you look at the work, there seems to be this link. And this is, in a sense, a celebration of the Vietnamese people who have been badly scarred, but triumphant. And in a sense, if you go back to his, I mean, two early projects, the Tevaga diaries and the tea garden journals and so on, you'll see what started there as a kind of struggle that finds a small victory in the Vietnamese victory. And that is probably what he celebrates here. Now, there are other works we could go on, but I think let uh, my co-panelist who have their own trajectories and stories to say, I hope they come in. Shonda, Shonda, the same question to you. Are there any particular works of Shomnatho that resonate with you and you know, really also help you connect back to these early years uh, with his, his later works? Firstly, thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, and, um, and of course, my regards to Shivada, who just now so lucidly and deeply uh, narrated uh, the kind of a nutshell about uh, the main thrust of uh, Shomnath Thor's work. And uh, of course, I am a practicing theater director and a filmmaker, but of course, I am deeply uh, involved. Uh, I, have, I, have, I have seen Shomnath Thor's work, and, and, uh, and of course, it has deeply impacted me, inspired me. Uh, although I cannot define with uh, so much particularity about the, the forms, but 
whatever whatever rudimentary knowledge I have, know, have about the paintings and the artworks, I can always reflect that how deeply it uh, kind of impacted me um, as because, you know, the one thing which I believe from my beginning of my practice of theater and filmmaking, and always I think that when Shiva the said that, of course, he was thematically repeating himself, but he's continuously looking for new idioms, new mediums to express the, the boredom of talking about the same content, because the ideological commitment is not letting me go out of that content. At the same time, I'm looking artistic uh, journeys. I'm looking for new artistic experiment which might uh, bring me out of that boredom and give my ideological commitment a new shape, a new artistic idiom, new artistic voice. I think that is very important for me uh, as an artist, in, as a performing artist, that when, uh, when I remember one of the famous filmmakers of contemporary times, Abbas Kiryostami from Iran, when he mentioned in one of his interviews that I made actually one film throughout my life, but in different segments. Uh, so he's saying that I'm continuously trying to hammer, say about the same things throughout my life. I have one agenda, and one thing to say again and again and again, but I am looking, uh, but saying it in parts and every time that, every time it became a new cinematic journey, new cinematic experiment. And, and that kind of, I, I suddenly reminded of that uh, Kirostami's uh, uh, interview, part of that interview. And, and about Shomnadda, the I think the project Oons, which, which I saw when I was actually trying to grow up as an artist, trying to take as much as I can from the, from the world of all kinds of mediums, from paintings, from sculptures, from literature, from cinema, wherever, whatever, whatever possible to kind of grasp, kind of digest them. And wounds was a kind of uh, what what I felt. It is not about the content, but the, again, which I think Shivada mentioned, the materiality of the, the the thing that how he was looking for the different materials and the different processes, different methodologies to confront each and every theme, each and every content. You know that that how we making the political comment through using the material. A different material every time, and, and every time he was using what I have seen his trajectory, his evolution of his uh, of his artistic mastery. Uh, when he's documenting uh, Tebhaga Andolon, or he was do documenting Monnantor, and then when we come to the Oons, which is a long journey, I'm seeing that he's continuously giving a new shape, uh, trying to bring those same you know, ideas, same painful, uh, painful images, very, very difficult images, which we are difficult to confront, which are again confronted with now in contemporary India. But every time it is looking different because of his material choice and his processes of creating that different art. So I, always I, I have been throughout my life, I was trying to say that we can have ideological commitments we can talk about contemporary politics, sociology, everything, but but it has to be validated by proper artistic uh, voicing. It cannot be just talking, getting up on a stage or taking a camera and just saying, you know, some strong ideological comments, giving just uh, proclaiming that I'm I'm ideologically committed. I have this. Uh, moral responsibility, of course we have, but why you are an artist? Why you are a painter? Why you are a filmmaker? Why you are a theatre director? And you can you can write, you can just stand up on stage, take a microphone, say, but while you were speaking from the stage, or you have a camera to, 
to voice your concerns, to voice your uh, your your tussle with the society and your political commitment, it has to have that artistic uh, validity, that, that artistic experiment, um, an artistic honesty, and I would say same time, to, to voice them, to bring them out. So I think this is the most important, what I found in Shomnath's whole work that he always you know uh, we have we have seen deeply committed artists we have seen but we have seen the connection how Picasso was involved into the Spanish Civil War we have seen how Sartre was was commenting on Algerian warfare we, we have seen the uh, major major works of artists who are coming out and really reflecting on the social political events and and see the 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 kind of mastery they have on their art and how they're actually validating uh, their comment through their artistic uh, way. It, it is not so easy. It is not so easy to put it out, your, your, your commentary, your, your ideological concerns in an artistic way, which Homnath has mastered, as genius has mastered it, that when he put in the wounds and then using the paper pulp as an expression, that how you're physically actually responding to that. You can, it is not an intellectual uh, response to it. I mean, I'm watching those, those artwork, I'm, I'm getting a physical uh, reaction. A physical reaction is happening because it, it is a material. It is the materiality which uh, Shomrand has taught us that you know, every time find a new way, maybe you're saying the same thing, maybe I'm hammering the same thing since my, 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 my second world war trauma, what she, she was just mentioning. To the last point, the end point of life, maybe I'm suffering from the trauma and I'm always trying to express that through my art. But every time it's coming as a new dimension, a new meaning uh, and a new expression of art, always pushing the boundary of you know, artistic creation more and more and more and more and more. And I think that's the artist job as an ideologue or as an ideologue, a, a, a man who is committed to his ideology. Of, of to serve people or to speak to people or to engage with the people. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think uh, it, this balance or this trying the struggle between an artistic commitment or an aesthetic commitment and the political commitment is something that plays out across his work. And he also struggles with it. But I was just wondering why that artistic commitment is so important, you know, or why it's so important to create this aesthetic expression of uh, suffering of your you know of trauma of oppression um and what he's trying to really create uh, as an interface between himself the people who view the work the trauma that he carries through this material expression so Sanchan, are, are there any examples that speak to that uh, for you in, in shomnata's work where um we really see this aesthetic expression having a deep impact on you yourself uh, as an artist uh, and as a viewer of his work I think uh, if you look at uh, Shunatas, because I uh, only saw when I went there as a student and he was already retired and so I didn't see him working in the studio uh, that much. Mm, but uh, what has really uh, struck me in a sense as you go through his uh, diaries or the more anthropological documentations and then moving into this more material based work is at the core there is a uh, in a more uh, critical sense there is this whole idea of looking at things from multiple point of views and that that looking at the same phenomena over and over again what Shumanda has been talking about and uh, it's not that uh, the issue is underlined in a very uh, representational way there are different ways in which he is doing it, but I'm always intrigued that how within a modernist methodology, he has been constantly keeping himself outside the work. I mean, because most of the time we find this stylistic impositions and uh, the more than the work, it is the style of the individual artist that becomes a dominant phenomenon. And you, the work almost propagates the individual. But if you look at some of those work, that sense of distancing and then making it physically active, the material, the work itself becomes the embodiment than the individual. 
that has been a very fascinating thing that uh, and i think that happened also i don't know why he uh, left delhi and came to shantiniketan but this whole pedagogic shift to his uh, uh, practice and uh, moving into an institutional space and then continuing a certain uh, alternative voice where he's not necessarily not conforming to one method of working but constantly shifting to multiple tools multiple engagements and is itself i think is a political statement that what i mean by practice in a sense that i'm not producing objects for the market that needs that gets validated and then i build up a certain you know uh, nuance around it but i'm constantly challenging that notion that what is my identity as a practitioner and uh, and one work which i we are looking at again shivda very recently shivda was also there uh, the mural he did and it it really uh, it's not that it is underlying that political statement or it has that image in a sense that uh, which talks about the whole uh, concern of the pain and the whole suffering that he has seen or he has gone through but that mural for me it's a very unique work in context of the shantiniketan uh, methodology of looking at multiplicity in a, in a sense that how he has brought in these different tools to coexist uh, it's like a mural as a as a collage in a sense but it's also very independently viable and uh, as we as we today talk about this criticality of practice and looking at things from multiple methods and directions and point of views i think that mural itself has uh, stands out as uh, a very unique uh, both a pedagogical uh, work but also as a kind of a statement of his journey that how he's balancing the what uh, shumanda is talking about also and shivda is referring that how he is uh, moving between this uh, two point of this personal uh, experiences of of certain social phenomena and tool practice itself it's as a kind of ideology and how uh, that itself just and, and it's not just one work and it's not just one phenomena but it's a span of thing through which you have to read it i think this is another very important thing that you cannot just judge shumnathur with one body of work you you have to see the overall uh, span and how things he has moved around certain uh, social concern and uh, how he has reengaged with it over and over again so yeah i mean i was just thinking that uh, uh, instead of pointing out one particular work this whole absolutely absolutely you know, so we've we touched this. upon his personal tra tragedy and how the personal is transformed in the political we've looked at how um, the political commitment or the thematic commitment uh, that he had to the themes of suffering oppression um, pain and trauma then is constantly balanced and tussled with this kind of commitment as an artist to the material to the form and to constantly experimenting with that um, and shonchanda you brought us to a nice point where we also saying that um, as an artist his political practice extended beyond making the works but to his pedagogy to his uh, role as a teacher to his engagement with his students um so and and interestingly also in his works the works that say shumanda mentioned which is wounds we see that his choice of material itself is very political why is he choosing paper or why is he choosing print um how is he conscious of the marks and the abrasions that are made in the print making process and translating those marks and abrasions into a form that represents pain trauma tragedy so he's very aware of the process and the process itself becomes a part of the art and i think that's also something very interesting and i wanted to ask all of you as well as practicing artists as teachers um how does the process of how does your politics also reflect not just in the subject or in your formal expression of the subject or the thematic but also in the process uh, in which you choose to make art who you make it with how it's made what are the hierarchies that come into play and what are the ones that you try to subvert um so how is that reflected i know in theater shumanda you know that that has also been experimented with a lot so across theater visual art and teaching how does that uh, the idea of the process itself being political translate in your own practice Uh, i think that it is a very important aspect of uh, you know the the processes when we come to the to the to the matter of processes that i think that process itself the process itself is the political 
thing that how you are processing your, uh, especially when we as a theater artist and a filmmaker, you're always working in a group, right? It's a collective activity. Like, uh, and you know, uh, where you have to not only have a collective sensibility to interact with the, with the socio-political movements, the dynamics, the political dynamics of the society, you want to, you want to comment on it through history or to contemporary events. Uh, so we are continuously, and we are with a group of people, you're an ensemble uh, to continuously engage this ensemble to that process is itself a, a political act. I think that you don't have to overtly, you know, it is not about doing history classes, political classes. It is about, it is about while you are engaging itself in the, in the making of the creation of the, of the rehearsal process in, in the case of theater, and we do rehearsals in filmmaking also, and how actually how multidisciplinary uh, you are being to bring your ensemble to one one tune and one motivation, which can help you to, we can help them to bring out the kind of conversation or kind of engagement you are wanting them with the audience. Because you know, as a theater director, you were completely dependent on the moment of the, of the performance, when, when the things are actually getting the dialogue is happen, happening with the audience. But that time is completely, you, are, you have nothing to do with that space. You have you have given some you know you have given you have created some uh, some artwork which is now getting unfolded in front of the audience to the direct interaction so that is very vulnerable at the same time uh, it can very momented so theater as an art is there you know that's very important so you have to you have to be while while creating the process your your whatever ideological base you have but while you are you're creating the process through with your scenographer with your music director and mostly with your actors or your li lighting designer what you bring together to bring that ensemble that when they are performing they are tuned in a kind of one ide ideological commitment like when recently i did a play called mephisto which is based on the german novel and I did it definitely, uh, I made it a point that I will do within the elections. I want to, I want to do this play within the elections so I can bring up my audience to a kind of, you know, to, to bring that memory back to the, to the audience that what was the history, where the history lies. And I wanted to make my ensemble to able to, to, to voice this history with the commitment without understanding that that's doing a play for the sake of doing a play, no, they are narrating a piece of history to attain something and remind people of something, and it became interactive. You know, immediately the you know the, the moments of theater pieces, the moments of history, and immediately people are taking me. You know, I remembering that comment of that politician when you were citing that. So I think that and why didn't you say that? Somebody asked me. Well, I didn't say that because your dialogue is going on in your mind continuously, and you are continuously reflecting and uh, you know engaging with that that moment, and that's important. So I made it a point, and I see it worked. You know, when people when when the when the entire ensemble was through a process. Of speaking, we did it only ten days. To tell you very, to very um, truthfully, honestly, we did the entire process in ten days. It's not a matter of time. It's not a length of time. It can be one year. It can be ten days. But when we when we're together in a process to address the dynamics, to address the socio-political agenda, and when we're together, the same team, it started working. You know, automatically. It it is an organic expression which comes in. and you have to depend on the organic you know subconscious to work on you continuously and that's why the trauma memory your personal experience is so important to be part of your ideological construct you cannot throw them out they have to be part of your you know whatever theoretical reading you do that will only sharpen your way of reflecting your memories your traumas your deep subconscious your deep fears your deep uh, joys, but you have to continue to sharpen with the theoretical understanding.
but you cannot leave them. You have to continuously provoke and 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 you know, a kind of uh, try to put the finger around that truth, which is inside you, and try to bring that out. Try to express that out. Try to bring it out of yourself. That's that's the process, I think. So, and we, I do it with my actors, with my collaborators. Uh, like like I did mini theater work with Shonchan. Me and Shonchan has collaborated in different theater pieces, including Romudranath Bishorchan. And, and recently Mephisto is also done by Shonchan, uh, this last play, which I'm just, just mentioning. So I think that's very important to um, engage ourselves and our commitment to our times. At, like it, it may sound like some kind of truism, but an artist should have, the, have to speak the truth and they have to, they have to be with the truth and speak honestly. It, it, sound, it will sound like truism, but what is truth can be another question, quote unquote. But I think that when we are talking about truth, which is, which is our ideological truth we are talking about. So we can get into a big debate on this truth and what is truth and what is false, because we are in the times of double speak, right? In George Aurelian uh, term. But, but still, what, when I say that is my truth, my memory, my experience with the society is my truth. And I have to be committed to that. Is there a way in which this personal truth then interacts with the, the collective in the art, in the process of art making itself? I know you have also engaged with that because for in many no, of your think, work, yeah, the subject it, it, becomes more than just the subject. It becomes a part of the process. So. No, no, I think the whole uh, thing started off in a very process uh, context only because uh, I'm trained as a painter and I've spent seven years rigorously in the studio. But there was this whole, uh, you know, uh, concern about what I'm painting is only one kind of truth. And I'm engaging with the material, with the object, with the life around. And it has its multiple histories, multiple relationships and multiple. So I was always thinking that how to engage in that framework of these dynamics when I look at certain entity or certain object. And this uh, led to uh, this uh, idea of engaging with different uh, memories, different histories. And, uh, and of course, the, my experience with Badolda played a very interesting role in this one because he, his workshops really uh, introduced, and I was looking at this multiplicity around me because Shantiniketan is about, you know, if you see the campus of Shantiniketan, it's uh, the sculptures, the murals, the architecture, the physical space of the campus, everything takes you into that multiplicity in a sense that you encounter, constantly encounter. And also the whole community rituals, you, you engage with the landscape in so many different ways. You enter into it in so many different ways. And I was looking for a methodology, how this whole uh, dynamics could be incorporated in the artistic method of, of the process of making also. And Badalda's workshop really gave me that uh, insight, you know, so how the process can be a shared process and how uh, the process can emerge from collective participation and where the idea or the notion that I'm introducing or I'm learning from the group can become a starting point, but necessarily doesn't become the end of it. And it grows into uh, a different direction. And um, of course, uh, coming in contact with theater in Kolkata and then trying my own process of installation performances in different locations in Kolkata in the 90s, late 90s, was giving me this shape of a certain methodology of how to engage. And I was slowly more and more convinced that I'm more interested in a space where there are a collective uh, engagement of different perspectives, different point of views coming together. And I'm becoming one of those shared entities, you know, and uh, depending much on how things can configure. Uh, but then joining Kolohoban also gave me another very different perspective that uh, the whole idea of the pedagogical uh, notion of this whole circularity that Tagore is constantly that you are in the circle in the sense, and Badalda is also talking about the circularity that it's a democratic space of learning together and failing together, which is so much important. Uh, so, uh, so today, if you look at the way I want to work or the way I work, I just cannot work alone. 
<laughs> this is something that has happened in a uh, thing that uh, I have to engage with a certain materiality, not in isolation, but in a certain uh, group uh, relationship and learning and discursing together with that process. Uh, so uh, institutional space becomes a very important space for, to engage. I mean, not from outside, but from inside. Uh, how much, whatever form, because institutions are becoming so, also very complicated spaces uh, because, but still I feel that institutional spaces are the few possible spaces of multiplicity. At least you will find multiple voices to come together to engage and you can at least have some conversation. You cannot, I mean, the outside world is becoming very difficult in a sense. <laughs> so, um, so for me, it, it, it moves back and forth. And I look at pedagogy as a very active method in the public domain. And I think you as a practitioner also must be feeling it that how this, uh, uh, you know, participating in a certain existing uh, process and with these multiple memories and fragments coexisting together. And as a practitioner, you are just uh, trying to uh, make uh, space within it and trying to propose certain possibility and then the possibility becomes something else. So this uh, uh, becomes a very uh, important criteria. Uh, so I can just show you one or two uh, experiences of mine in the sense this is an interaction with the, because many of the time what happens that uh, you engage with the students, with the, you discuss a lot of issues, social issues that is going on around you. And then there are possibilities where you can also uh, have a certain conversation with the public spaces outside. And this was a, in situation where I got uh, an invitation of, uh, to generate an artwork. Uh, in response to what is terrorism and what is happening in 2009, when all the galleries in Kolkata came together and they thought that they should address these issues collectively. Uh, so uh, for me, it was a very uh, challenging uh, project in a sense that as a person, I have not really experienced terrorism. So I have read about it. I have not met a terrorist as such. And, uh, and I've not been really, uh, it's, it's only media related information and what you, configure out of a mediated information is always multiple truths. I mean, in what way it happens. So it was important to have a physical engagement with it. And uh, fortunately, Kalahoman is still a very national uh, institution where people, students come from all over the country. And in that time, there were a lot of students who were coming from Kashmir and the Northeastern uh, borders of India. And so I just, uh, made a poster in the campus and asked them that if students who are from these areas, if you want to have an interaction, uh, can we have a meeting? And then most of the students came from that. And I then I proposed to them that I have got this proposal from the gallery. So would you like to join with me and we can together uh, explore uh, your memories and my memories together in a certain process. So. Uh, they sort of agreed to share it in the campus. So we did group interactions, basically recording their personal memories of living in places which are quote unquote termed as terrorist spaces and their interpretation of how they look at this world that uh, whether it's your ter terrorism or my terrorism in a sense. And th these debates came up. And then it was important that, uh, but this was happening in individual groups. So I sort of, that to bring them together in a group interaction. So in Kolkata, this space of Kandhar Art Gallery was given to me. It was the bedroom of Shudipta Di, Shudipta Sen. So she was very kind enough that, okay, I'm giving you this bedroom, you can work here. So uh, there uh, we had a workshop about these interactions. And so now all these uh, in individual group interactions, they came and we had a game of storytelling. Of course, derived from Badalda's uh, numerous games on uh, group interactions and telling your own narratives, you know. And then we had a whole day of interactions. So they were uh, sharing each other's point of views. And then it came to a point that how do we register these memories? How do we register it in the space? So, uh, so these are the students. They uh, sort of wrote and they made a brochure for themselves that why they came to Shantiniketan to study, what was the reason they left their homeland and came for higher studies. And then uh, we thought of, they thought of uh, doing some writing and scribbles. So 
I sort of told them, okay, then you use this room, this uh, the furnitures and everything are available, but I will not define where, who will write what. That you have to, as a group, discover for yourself how much space you want to occupy. So that itself became a workshop, okay, how much they were occupy a space, how much would leave for the other and in that whole process. This, uh, so in the room, there was a window uh, in that uh, the, all the individual video projection recordings that we did in the campus that was shared. And uh, this uh, room then became a graffiti site for uh, the students. They decided like where to write what and how over they, it overlapped with each other's point of views. The whole uh, space within one day became a kind of a graffiti uh, drawings by students from different uh point of views that came up in the room and uh, these are some of the drawings that uh, came so they did also small performances somebody was interested in narrating poems somebody was interesting to sing some guzzles so all the things happened in this room so the room itself became a site uh, to develop their own ideas uh, and parallel to that i was also doing my own uh, research okay, what is uh, terrorism in a mediatic definition or what are the different ideas that are floating and then I came to know about this whole concept of butterfly effect that the small flapping of the wings of butterfly can become the cause of a tornado. Uh, so uh, I was also uh, trying to make a certain uh, comment on this whole uh, situation that how do you really look at when is that moment of violence or when did it really happen or why did it happen? There is no specific point uh, that you can identify in history. Shumanda must be thinking of his project which he did not do, uh, whether he was <laughs> Shushaposhachita's uh, text uh, on the Ashutthamas. Uh, and then finally there was a butterfly garden that was installed which we got from the uh, uh, Science City in Kolkata. They were kind enough to give us a butterfly plantation and then a butterfly planting their, their eggs in 21 days and that became a process of experience. And these are some of the works which were made by the students. So it was a group interaction which we shared together in the site for the public. So transferring it from a kind of a pedagogical interaction to uh, public uh, intervention in the location. So, Thank you. so you try to move back and forth in this kind of uh, situation, yeah. Thank you so much, Shumana and Chanchala, for so beautifully illustrating the fact that, you know, the process of making art is just as political and it needs to be just as carefully thought through. And perhaps that's where a lot of a lot of its power and potential also lies. But um, since we're nearing the end of our discussion, I'd like to go back to something Shivata said in the beginning about the optimism. Uh, you know, I never looked at uh, Shumanada's work as optimistic in that sense, especially his early work. Um, and um, also this, you know, this commitment that we've spoken on and on about, about, you know, to uh, the artistic commitment along with the political commitment. But, you know, in, in a moment of crisis like this, the one that we are facing or we sort of seem to be facing for the last um, X number, uh, last many years, um, and has built up now to this sort of extremely dystopic moment. What is, is, is optimism still an important tool? Um, and also, in, in a moment of crisis like this, do do we are we forced to put aside like our artistic commitment and commit, uh, you know, strongly and, and you know take do do whatever is necessary, whether it is giving lectures on a stage or you know forgetting about our art practice for a bit. Uh, is 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 that, is that put aside or is that still important? Is that artistic commitment to material and form? I know optimism is still important. Um, and Shiva, if you could just speak a little more about the spirit of optimism, and then I can ask uh, Sanchanda and. Also well, I mean, uh, unless one is optimistic, I mean, I'm not saying it in the sense that we now hear one has to be positive, not that. Yeah. One has to be optimistic deep within oneself somewhere. Otherwise, why should somebody like Somnath Poor spend their whole lifetime, I mean, documenting this suffering? Because there should be a hope that there will be a light at the end of the tunnel someday, somewhere. Otherwise, there's no meaning in spending one's life doing it. So that is what optimism means to the activist who is probably continuously seeing failures. So, 
I mean, people like him are deep down. They don't probably represent anything that would look optimistic to us. Rarely, if you look through his entire career, you might see one or two instances where he possibly sees something positive happening. But rest of the time, you might think it is suffering gloom that overpowers his career. But if you want to pers continue with that, persist with that, there should be a hope within himself. Otherwise, that would not happen. I mean, I think all these artists who are in most difficult times working are working with that sense of optimism. Sumanda Shonchana, do you feel uh, that sense of optimism that, that you are trying to hold on to? And, you know, how does that, um, how, how, how do you see your artistic commitment? You know, do you feel like it's kind of bearing, being able to bear the weight of what's going on? Um, or do you sometimes feel like putting it aside and uh, finding other spaces for politics outside your art as well? No, you know, I, I think that there is a, we ha, as an artist, you have to always put yourself in some kind of historical perspective. You cannot just, you know, uh, kind of shy away from that. It's, it's a question of your continuously, you know, this, this is a suffering again and again to, you know, to, it's, it's your conflict with the history, it's conflict, conflict with your contemporary situation that you are always, you have to, you have to, you have to really uh, take that inside you, and and of course that's as uh, Shibada was mentioning that you have to look for that little light at the end of the tunnel, uh, and and feel that there is something there, and we have to continuously, although we are seeing it through the images of suffering, images of pain, images of losses, uh, but that that mean that again that we are trying to engage ourselves with this contemporaneity and we cannot see any, you know, the, 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 quoting the famous uh, poem from Bertel Brecht that would there be, would there be um, singing there in the time of dark times? Yes, there will be singing of dark times. You know, we have to sing, sing our dark times. Uh, we cannot say that uh, we have to write uh, uh, poetry on flower, we have to do play on some kind of uh, positive situation, or we can finally bring out some kind of optimism to look forward to, to get out of this situation. So optimism is always one of the driving force for an artist and continuously engage an ideology at one point of time should not be kind of become a mask of, you know, kind of uh, self-interest, you know, it is not a mask of self-interest. Ideology is has to be interactive and put into some kind of historical perspective. There, there's one thing which became very popular at one point of time, uh, that is the end of ideology. It's a kind of saying that, you know, in a, in a welfare state, we have come to a certain kind of reality where everything can be solved by this, you know, small some pockets of multiplicity in, in, in our so-called, uh, you know, uh, pluralistic welfare state. So there is a conflict between the people who, who believe in the radical change of the society and some people who think that we can, we can solve the problem in a pluralistic welfare state if we can say it a welfare state and, and, and see. So there is an ideological dialogue on that happening, but there are some artists who still believe in some kind of radical change and some people who still think that we can, but ideology cannot be in at this point, you know, elitist, or you know, in a, you know, you know, up my own mask of self righteousness. Okay, I think that ideology has to be confrontational. It has to be continuously in engagement as everybody is trying to think. The the one reverberation which came coming out of everybody, it has to be engaging. It has to be it has to be continuously in dialogue with the people. It cannot be. It cannot get a birth only through your own creative ideological you know fascinations. It has to be continuously evolving and in criticality and engagement in multiplicity and, uh, and continuously, you know, trying to push your envelope of artistic engagement and artistic creation and give new, new, find, look for new boundaries 
new new for look uh, new for new light with that optimism that is most important Thank for today's artist Thank you so much for that. And I think we have, we've reached the end and we've crossed our time limit. Chanchal, if you have, if you can say something very briefly in a few words, just, just no, to yeah, have closing no, I remarks. Think, I think uh, most of the artists, I mean, it's, it's a proposition. We are all proposing something. We are not trying to conclude or we are not trying to. So even in dark times, you make propositions for future. And those propositions, and I think every time you come, there is no difference between an artistic embodiment and a general uh, being a social being so it is always overlapping and uh, this and you have to come with the artistic mode only i think uh, what you do you do and whether it is a dark time or it is a favorable time you have to assert it and place your proposition to the society and that's very important and you have to come over and over again it's not a one time job and that's that's for me that you have to be always coming back uh, because people tend to forget that's what it is so i hope all of you stay well i hope all, all of you stay safe uh, and best wishes to your family to everyone around you and after this we'll move over to the question answer session to expand this dialogue uh, with all those listening hi everybody who's here with us today i'm very happy uh, to see um, the panelists and the moderator with us because this what you were just viewing right now was the pre-recorded part of today uh, we took the precaution of doing this because we everybody been facing severe net uh, connectivity issues i would like to now invite shumona and the panelists to interact with the audience and take any questions that you may have thank you good to see everyone again thank you all for joining us today to those of whom who are joining live uh, we'll take questions if you can leave your questions or comments um, in the q and a box we'd be most grateful for that but in the meanwhile we have one comment um, from uh, devaprotu mukhopadhyay who's uh, mentioned that um, shumna thor's way of living was also an example and a philosophy and that needs understanding so perhaps we can revisit that idea of you know his life and his his practice as a process the which was political in itself um if shivada you'd want to just uh, you know if if you could just uh, open that up a little bit more again for us to engage with so one of the things that um i mean except if you're thinking that what you're doing is a craft if you're thinking that you are working for market then of course you might not have to live according to your art if you are not one such artist there cannot be a division between what you are doing and the way you are living certainly somnatha was somebody who was not an artist doing for the market he moved away and he was concerned with social issues but he was also not somebody who was not working with a party because that is what he found difficult and that too was because he found socialist philosophy and socialist parties moving in different directions so it was that eagerness to live by one's belief that made him move away from both the cities the art world as well as i mean association direct association with political parties and his shift from delhi to shantiniketan i think was part of it because he saw he had predecessors there who could commit themselves to issues and remain on the boundaries on the margins and address serious issues so i think he certainly tried that and whenever either the market through the galleries or i mean the party that he was very close to ideologically when they tried to do something special for him he always stepped back and uh rejected it to some extent and this shows that he wanted to live by those ideals and 
he tried his best to do that as a person. So certainly this is true of Somnatha and perhaps of a small number of artists who see their vision, their ideological grounding and their art as closely interrelated. Thank you, Shadadash. And, um, there, I, you know, sometimes though, this personal resistance or this personal commitment, uh, you know, sometimes you, seems too little. And so with regards to that, we have a question from uh, Dhriti Manchatiji. Thank you for being here and for your question. Uh, in these dark times as artists, how do we negotiate, resist the large scale subversion of institutions that we see happening all around us? Is, is this level of personal or collective political engagement enough? Or is there a way in which we can uh, negotiate and resist the large-scale subversion of institutions? Yeah, uh, I would personally think, yes, we need to do something more than personal. But the personal is what we can begin with, each one of us. Uh, because if we don't begin with the personal, the possibility of maybe building up that collective doesn't kind of happen. Because we can probably come together for short periods to maybe achieve short-term goals. But if there is a long-term transformation that is necessary, the personal has to be there. That is my feeling. So I would think that these two things cannot be separated, that one can have the collective without the personal. I'm to ask you that you would want to address uh, this. No, I think uh, any institutional space operates in two levels. One, which is the internal dynamics, which you have to sustain. Sustain it in a sense, not as a continuity, but constantly revitalize uh, it, readdress it. And, and there will be challenges which uh, comes from external forces in the sense, the governing systems and how uh, it will be run or how it will be operated and uh, so this uh, and it has happened in Tagore's time also that uh, institutions like Shantini has operated has coexisted with both the external influences and bringing in people from outside and uh, then placing them in the present body of uh, pedagogues and then creating movements within the system itself. Uh, which is, I think, but that was possible in a sense, it was more uh, more privately run uh, institution. But for government institutions, it, it becomes uh, a very uh, challenging space in the sense that you are not only uh, negotiating with the certain systems that you are bringing in, uh, but you are also trying to find perforations, spaces where the personal can generate uh, moments of uh, can operate as an interface between what is public and what is the private within an institutional space. So, uh, and especially in today's time, uh, this whole conflict of the institutional identity and what is happening outside the institutional identity uh, practices needs to be kind of co-opted in a sense that there has to be collaborations, there has to be uh, conversations uh, which uh, can subvert the present methodologies or, or present because there is a, a way in which things are being appropriated today in a uh, sense that with uh, our present institutional forms we are trying to uh, appropriate what is quote unquote referred as progressive or what is quote unquote referred as communitarian. Uh, so that also uh, needs to be constantly uh, readdressed. And I feel uh, we are more and more moving into that direction where the pub private public uh, dialogues has to be more an active, uh, like what happens in Kochi Biennale, Students Biennale, and what is happening in different universities. And this kind of collaboration, this kind of uh, interactions uh, should be, but it can happen only in personal level. I mean, institutions are still not ready to become stakeholders or collaborators directly with private organizations. I mean, at least in India, it is still not that form. Uh, but uh, I think the personal has that possibility where it can generate a lot of movements 
and uh, find lot of spaces in between uh, and operate and generate that sense of dynamics uh, continuously. And that's an important responsibility, I think, as a pedagogy, as a practice, if you look at it, it, it becomes a very important role that you play also. Right, and especially for you sitting within one such institutional space, which has its own, uh, you know, kind of politics being subverted. I think that's a very important insight. And uh, Devomita Nag also mentions this that you know how can uh, this for this this work of the artist find a kind of more public connection, whether it's through educational processes or whether it's through taking it outside the market and outside looking at art as just a commodity. So thank you, Devomita, um, ma'am, for your comment. Um, I'll, um, Shumanda, if you would also like to address this idea of institution, but uh, of, you know, how do we sort of work against these institutions, but I'll also just add uh, a question from uh, Anjum, um, a question for Shumon and Shonchan. Uh, does ideology today still imply leftist ideology? And what way has it shifted to a different or broader understanding, if at all? Mm. To kind of address the um, Ritmanda's question, I think that it, it is a, it's a con deep concern for everybody of us because how the institutional parameters are working right now, you know, they are creating lies. It's, it is, it's a society of double speak, right? So, and, and it's completely centralized, it's trying to centralize and co-opt everything. So at, in this kind of context, I think that... Uh, it's very important because it is slowly, you know, it is in also interesting that how we are slowly this this entire centralization process or the or the um, or the methodology of bringing everything to the institutional power to the centralized few heads in the and the in the, in the head of the power. So now this is getting slowly exposed, you know. So I think that slowly this exposition has started to happen. Uh, and we have seen it in the COVID situation that how uh, and how the things are getting exposed, how the lies are getting exposed. So I think at this point of time, the artists play a very important role by creating smaller areas of dialogue. No, it, it has to be confronted and countered with the smaller areas of dialogue. And that has to be devised very interestingly, creatively and with a kind of commitment that you have to fight this institution, of course, there is, and, and they are trying to broaden it up in a way and centralize everything to some kind of, you know, one mode of power. But I think that there is a point of subversion and we have seen this is working. I and mean, if we take lessons from the history, that when Jaapal Sartre was trying to create this magazine, is one magazine, literary magazine in, in Paris, and started his, uh, his fight against the authorities and also a fight with the Communist Party at the same time. You know, as uh, uh, we have been discussing earlier that Shomnadda was never part of any party. You know, so that was very important that, that an independent artist without any uh, kind of uh, membership of a party or under any kind of flag, they are trying to, you know, engage in their own way with the social commitment to expose the times. And this can be done in smaller pockets of in engagement. As Ramadanath has only taught us about this, that how we can create the smaller pockets of engagement, work locally, and this will spread. This will have a uh, effect, ripple effect, you know, throughout the society. And we have seen it happen before against any kind of authorities or, you know, fascist power, I think so, for trying to centralize everything. And I think that it has to be consistent and relentless in this fight. We have to continuously do plays, do activities, uh, and engage people in a dialogue with your art, with your poetry, with your theater, with your cinema, whatever possible form. You know, I think that that has um, it cannot be done in a kind of isolation right now. So I think that is has to be the, if you really an artist with an ideological social commitment, we think you have to do something, you have to do something and kind of uh, subvert the, um, the ways, then you have to be relentless. You have to continuously work and, and have the dialogue with the people. Thank you. That's really inspiring and in a way utopic, but uh, I guess that's what mm -hmm. we have to hold on to. Uh, but uh, I think with this 
with any final comments from the panelists, we'll wrap up the in session. In terms because of the uh, leftist methodology that Tanjum was referring to, I think uh, uh, Tagore has a very uh, Tagore's methodology has something to offer in this context. That whole notion of individual and the collective. I mean, uh, and to create this what Shumanda was talking about, this smaller informal uh, methods of engaging. That is the only way that we can sustain a certain alternative voice within the institutional spaces. And uh, this informality should go beyond the disciplinary specificity. It should uh, constantly, you know, challenge the closing down of the centrality that Shumanda is talking by bringing in practices together. Of, uh, and university can become that uh, platform because there is so much of disciplinary rigor that is going on. But what it lacks sometimes is its immediate connection with the reality outside, the locality outside, the context in which it is being practiced in. Most of the universities you will find it's all within the walls. And unfortunately, things are happening in the way in Shantinikatan also that it's, it's trying almost becoming this kind of seclusion, which has, has not been the history of the institute. So how uh, these conversations of the immediate locality and and, and I think uh, the COVID situation has, the online situation in some way has uh, created that focus in a sense that how you look at your immediate locality. And so when it opens again, I think this going to, this methodology will itself emerge as uh, in a new form in a sense that where, how the local context of the situation and the institutional rigor can come together and uh, work towards a framework. So, that sense of uh, mm, critiquing, that sense of uh, questioning a certain uh, tool or a certain history or a certain process uh, has to have this interface of the institutional rigor and the immediate reality of the locality in which you work and function together. With that, I'll close today's session. Thank you for joining us again and for taking the time Thank to you. You know, answer the audience questions. Thank you to the audience for your questions. Um, and take care, everyone. Stay safe. I hope everyone stays OK through these very difficult times. And see you on the other side. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, Shumona, for holding this session together so beautifully. Thank you, Shumon, Shonchayon, Shivda, for um, all the time and effort you put in. And it was a very, very interesting and and i think intense discussion i think we explored lots of very uh, ideas in, in quite a lot of depth so thank you so much for that and to all the people who joined in to listen and to ask questions and i think um, after this ashanta is here to say uh, a thank you from her side as well thank you anjum and thank you to all of you. I knew Shom Shomnath Babu personally. I visited him many times and with my father and without him. And um, he is one of the artists that I respect most. I have quite a few of his paintings and he has gifted me uh, two of his sculptures. So uh, I really cherish my memories with him. Thank you to all of you for participating in Navannu and enriching this session so much. Thank you.